<clears throat> Today's Torah portion, we went through, learned more about the offerings, the sacrifices, and the priestly duties and obligations for them. Okay. But also today is Shabbat Paraz. We are preparing for Passover in just a couple of weeks. Should be uh, our houses. Well, we're going to get them clean, right? Um, get all the leaven and stuff out of them. <laughs> um, but also to do a search of our own hearts, right? Um, as we know, in essence, what we are taught uh, by Shalom and from Yeshua HaMashiach that our bodies are to be like the temple of God, right? And what's interesting is that Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, all these different offerings, sacrifices are done, but you know, the interesting thing about it is the people. The temple had to be cleansed once a year. And so they would go through and cleanse and uh, with the blood, the offerings sprinkle upon them to purify them once again. Why? Because the sins of the people uh, were gathered there, right? They would accumulate. So once a year, God would do a house cleaning, spring cleaning, like we're getting ready to do with our own houses, right? With our own houses. We do spring cleaning, get rid of the old leaven, get rid of the old stuff, get rid of these things that, that are unclean now. And as Rav Shaul says, for we are all unleavened. So let us partake of the Passover with clean, with as as being unleavened, right? So anyways, the other thing is I want to go through is Parshat, or Shabbat Para. What's interesting about this is that it's from the um, uh, Torah portion called Chukat, which is regulation. But these are regulations that seem to have no real uh, meaning to them when we look at it. Why do we do these things? That's what the question of Chukat is. It's a question. Why do we do these things? There's no real explanation as to why we do these things. But when we look at this, we see a transference. Okay? And as we read through it, we see that there's a transference of the person who's clean clean becomes unclean. But the person who was unclean now becomes clean. Right? And we read the same thing in the Besorah portion too of, of Yeshua. Because he's getting ready for Passover, right? We read that part about, you know, coming up. Um, we've got Passover at the end of uh, April. I know they've got Easter this uh, the, the tomorrow. But this has nothing to do with Easter, just so you know. The resurrection day was on the 16th of Nisan. It doesn't matter what day it falls on. But it's after, it has to do with Passover, not with Easter, okay? So Yeshua's resurrection day was on the 16th of Nisan, um, which was a first fruits that the priests would go out to the field, cut some grain, bring it into the temple, and wave it as a first fruits offering to God. And as we know, uh, Rock is the first fruit. Um, that he is the first fruit of those uh, to be resurrected, right? Those who will enter his kingdom. He is the first. He is that first portion, right? <clears throat> so, how does this all work? Yeshua became a transference for us. Okay? He became dead on our behalf. Right? He became dead on our behalf. Think about that. On our behalf. He took our place, right? And through him was a transference of our sins onto him on the stake or the cross, whatever you want to call it, okay? But then he rose on the third day, right? And it's third day according to Jewish reckoning. So if it was Friday, Friday would be one day. Saturday would be the second day. In the evening of Saturday, which would be Sunday, 
in the Jewish reckoning of days after dark, which would be the first day of the week, Sunday, uh, then that would be three days, okay? Which would fulfill what he said about uh, Jonah, too, that there would be like Jonah, right? And what we have interesting is somebody asked a good question, is that why didn't he allow Mary, Miriam, to touch him when he stood there before her? Why? Because he hadn't ascended to the Father yet. He hadn't brought his self or presented himself before God yet. Okay? Now we, we say, well, he does that the ascension later on, 40 days later, right? No. He, he did it right then and there because it had to be brought within that time frame. Remember, we hear a lot of the three days, right? Um, if you have, have this stuff left for three days... You, need, you can't eat it on 30, you need to burn it up, right? Or, uh, as we see in the Psalms, that God will raise us uh, on the third day, right? That he will fill he will us and purify us on the third day. We see that they need to be sprinkled on the third day and the seventh day. Seventh day is completion, right? <clears throat> well, in this sense, when Yeshua died and when he rose, there was a transference. And so when he went to go to the Father, he took that with him and transferred all our sins onto the heavenly altar. Okay? Through him, our sins were transferred to him. And as the Talmud teaches that, teaches us that a righteous man who dies can uh, clear the, or take away the sins of his generation. But a truly righteous man, in essence like Yeshua, can take away the sins of all generations. Okay? And this is something that we're looking at too. And I want you to see this as we're doing the transference. But an awesome thing takes place here. When the Pharisees are there trying to uh, accuse Yeshua and stuff, they're jealous of his power, uh, of these things, and they bring to mind these certain things uh, that weren't accidental. There's no coincidence. Okay. So, Ed Kohanim and the Prushim called a meeting of the Sanhedrin and said, what are we going to do? For this man is performing many miracles. If we let him keep going on this way, everyone will trust in him and the Romans will come and destroy both the temple and the nation. But one of them, Caiapha, who was the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, that year, see, before it was passed down through the descendants of Aaron. <clears throat> During the time of uh, the Romans, they would put that um, up for uh, auction, the position. They might go one year, they might go two years or three years, but usually, or it might be six months. It was when they wanted money. When they wanted more money and stuff, they would put it up for auction. So the highest bidder, in essence, would get the position. And so this year it was Caiaphas, right? Caiaphas in Hebrew. <clears throat> and he was, Kohen Gadol that year said to them, and listen, listen, you people don't know anything. You don't see that it's better for you if one man dies on behalf of the people so that the whole nation won't be destroyed. And it says here, it wasn't him speaking in his own on his own, but because he was Kohen Gadol that, that year, the Holy Spirit came upon him and he prophesied. This is what this meaning is. So, with the, uh, same with the red heifer, in this sense, um, not that it took away sins, but it represented that, that the person who brought it, the, the high priest who was the son, who was going to be the high priest after after his father, he would take the position after him, would take it out and it would be killed. And then he would, uh, then it would be burned up, but it wouldn't be burned up by him. He would be, um, he would be unclean and go back. Another person would take the position to, uh, to burn it up. Okay, so the, high, the son of the high priest would then be unclean. He was clean, now he becomes unclean. Okay, <clears throat> the person who has to be clean. But then in turn, he becomes unclean. 
The person who collects the ashes has to be a clean person, ritually fit. Okay, that's what it means. But once he does that and he collects it and puts it in the spot, then he becomes unclean. He has to follow the same procedure. He needs to wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. Right? And what's interesting is that when the time comes, it's talking about dead bodies, death cannot enter the presence of God. Why? Because God is living. He's full of life. Death is an abomination. Death is not what he gives us. It's not part of him. It's what we brought into the world. And so it cannot be in his presence, right? And that's why um, and a person who has uh, 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 leprosy or, or uh, the, uh, sarat cannot bring an offering into the temple of the tabernacle, right? A person who is unclean through nida, which is um, the, the cycle of a woman, it's not sin, it's just uh, um, impure, right? Um, and other and other things, uh, uh, in a, a nocturnal emission by a man or whatever, in those senses, these things that make a person unclean represent death. God does not want that in his presence. That's why he also goes, yes? Oh, they had leprosy, leprosy and, you know, cancer. I mean, God still had a provision, even though they couldn't go in. And oh, yeah. They weren't rejected. They just couldn't go into. Somebody could do it for them, maybe? Well, they could bring an offer, have somebody do that for them, but they would still not be able to go in there until their time of purification. Right. And that would be even with the woman with Nida or the man who had a emission or touched a dead body, especially in particular here. That's why we're going through the dead body aspect of it. Um, because it would make you unclean, whether it was of a human being, an animal, or you touched bones. A uh, descendant of Aaron is not even allowed to go into a um, graveyard or a cemetery. He's not allowed to even touch the gate or its property. Yep. Yep. That's how. Even it. Huh? Yeah. Well, I mean, your loved one is passing. And you're in your funeral home. And there's such and such in their face where God's yeah. saying, it's okay, I know what you're thinking, but that's not necessary. Well, he he doesn't want us to keep from going there. He wants, so we'd make ourselves unclean for doing that. But right now, we don't temple, so we don't worry. We don't worry about that right now. Yeah, so it's not, yeah, it's not sin, it's just a ritual uncleanness, yeah. This was during the temple is when they would do this, yep. Yep. Um, but, uh, yeah, you, so this is during the time, of, there's no, there's no uh, temple right now, so we don't necessarily have to do these things in this way. Now, when the temple is rebuilt, that's what we're looking for, that's what we're seeing in the news about a red heifer, that there is signs of a red heifer. We've got several different ones, and they have to wait two years, and they check them constantly. But if in those two years there's not found anything to disqualify it, then it will be the red heifer. But if there's found even a white hair in it, believe me, they check these things, then it's disqualified because it has to be completely red. Yeah, everywhere. And the thing is, nine red heifers have been... have. They've gone through nine red heifers. The tenth one, they say, is when the Messiah will return because he's going to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And he's going to need that red heifer in order to sprinkle upon the people. And as we read, read in the Haftarah portion, God is going to sprinkle water on his people and purify them, right? That's what it's talking about. The government? They're, um, most of them are for it. They're, the secular or uh, Arab nations don't like the idea, but and of course you've got other groups and stuff too. But most of the Israelis and most Jews are, are ready, are 
can't wait for it to begin again. You have another side to it too that uh, is pushing against it. And as we see, they're the ones who want to uh, give the land that it belongs to Israel to the Palestinians too. So they will. Yeah, it's that time uh, when Joseph reveals himself, when Judah protects his little brother, which we're seeing now, um, Israel protecting Yeshua, his, his reputation, because the Palestinians and the Arabs are trying to sully it along with other groups. Um, and the rabbis and stuff have come finally, because of October 7th, to Yeshua's side, saying, hey, he's a, he's a rabbi, he's Jewish, He's our brother. He's not a Palestinian. He's not an Arab. He's not a Muslim, which is what the Palestinians and a lot of the Arabs are trying to say. Um, so, yeah, and at that time, Israel, uh, Judah or Israel defending his brother. And then it's time after that soon, uh, Yeshua will reveal himself to his people. God doesn't operate on the terms of He's far and above that. Well, I believe and I think and the discussion is right there at this point. Well, the issue well, the issue's been decided long ago. Yeah. Yeah, it's been decided long ago. So and the thing is we do have groups. The adversaries got groups out there trying to pass laws, and Europe is one of them that and they have many laws already that are passed in the different countries there against uh, kosher killing, okay? You cannot kosher kill an animal in a lot of the European countries anymore. Canada is also working on a law to do that too, pushing for, uh, okay? Um, moving for this uh, alternative meat uh, program uh, where they make meat in the And also using meat as a meat substitute. Which aren't kosher, yeah, which aren't kosher, never will be. <laughs> yeah, meal for the worms. <laughs> but, anyways, getting back to this is that it's a transference. When we understand what Yeshua has done, he's made a transfer, okay? Um, just as the red heifer was a, was a tool of transference. The person becomes unclean, but the unclean becomes clean. Okay? And that's what Yeshua does. And that's what we see in Ezekiel, where we we're reading too, is that God is going to take people, and even though they're unclean, he's going to sprinkle water. That's where we get the term holy water, by the way, is through this uh, red heifer. Okay? Because the ashes are mixed with water. The water then becomes holy. Okay? And it's holy for sprinkling. Okay? This is where the Catholic Church and other places have gotten the idea of sprinkle. Right? Sprinkle, sprinkle, sprinkle. But it was from God's people, God's orders to the Kohanim, the priests, to do this. And so, that's what's coming up. Is that, that you know, just like... Um, well, before they went into the land to conquer it with, with Joshua, with Yoshua, right? God had them circumcise themselves, right? Because they had not done so in many years. They kind of left behind that commandment of Abraham. That God gave to Abraham circumcision. And so, not I'm not sure not all of them had, but a lot of them had just left that behind. And so, before they could go into the land, they had to be circumcised after they did that. Then God allowed them to go into the land, okay? Because it's a sign of the covenant. And those who wouldn't do that, well, they were cut off from their people. Sent off. Uh, the rabbis teach that uh, supernaturally, somehow they would die. God would let them die or whatever, you know? However it worked, but the thing is, is that they're spiritually cut off from Israel for doing that. 
Huh? Yeah, no blessing. Yeah. But they could repent, right? It was something we were talking about last week, I think, too, or um, uh, Wednesday night, I think, about uh, God's people. And Rav Shaul talking about, um, let me see that, about the grafting in part of it. Remember? I can't remember where that's at. Is that Romans? But it's talking about uh, the grafting in, the Gentiles being grafted in. Yeah. I don't, know, I don't know why I can't remember. It's one of my favorite ones to read. Sometimes you just forget. Here it is right here, chapter 11. starts here. Let's start with verse 11, I guess. Um, in that case, I say, isn't it that they have stumbled with the result that they have permanently fallen away? Heaven forbid. I guess it starts up here. Uh, chapter 11. The ones chosen have obtained, but the rest have been made stone-like, just as the Tanakh says. God has given them a spirit of dullness, eyes that do not see. And David says, let their dining table become for them a snare and a trap, a pitfall and a punishment. Let their eyes be darkened so that they can't see with their backs bent continually. In that case, I say, isn't it that they have stumbled permanently? Heaven forbid. In order to provoke them to jealousy. Moreover, if they're to the world, that is, if Israel's is being placed temporarily in a condition less favored than, the gen than of the Gentiles, is bringing riches to the latter, how much greater riches will Israel in its fullness bring them? However, to those of you who are Gentiles, I say this, since I myself am an em emissary sent to the Gentiles, I make known the importance of my work in the hope that somehow I may provoke some of my own people to jealousy and save some of them. For if their ca casting Yeshua aside means reconciliation for the world, what will their accepting him mean? It will be life from the death. If the challah offered at first fruits is holy, so is the whole loaf. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off and you, a wild olive, were grafted in among them and have become equal sharers in the rich root of the olive tree, then don't boast as if you were better than the branches. However, if you do boast, remember that you are not supporting the root. The root is supporting you. So you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. True, but so what? They were broken off because of their lack of faith. However, you keep your place only because of your faith. So be arrogant. On the contrary, be terrified. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he certainly won't spare you. So take a good look at God's kindness and his severity. On the one hand, severity towards those who fell off. But on the other hand, God's kindness toward you, provided you maintain yourselves in that kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. Moreover, the others, if they do not persist in their lack of faith, will be grafted in. 
because God is able to graft them back. They were cut out of what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted, contrary to nature, into a cultivated olive tree. How much more will these natural branches be grafted back into their own olive tree? So, none of us should be boasting. We have to realize that the olive tree, which is Israel, supports us. And who supports the olive tree? God. God feeds it, gives it its, what it needs, causes it to bloom, right? Gives us everything we need to bloom, to, to bear fruit, right? But some, as we know, won't. And so it's those ones that don't produce that the pruner goes and cuts off, but will graft in a branch from a wild olive tree, right? And that wild olive tree now takes part in that root. So those Gentiles that come in aren't separate from anybody. They're, they're not their own thing. God isn't taking them and separately and blessing them. He's blessing them because they've attached themselves to Israel. Okay? And so when we, or as Gentiles, all of us, but as Gentiles accept Yeshua as Messiah, they're not just accepting him by himself. Right? He's already in a family. We are joining that family. Now, we may not have the same responsibilities as the natural family, but we are no less part of the same family. And so the blessings that God is bestowing on Israel through uh, the roots, we also get to partake in it. Be blessed by that. Bear fruit through that, right? But if we're boasting and unwilling to accept who we're a part of, then we're rejecting Yeshua's message. Okay? And because of that, that then means we lack faith. And we will be doomed to be cut off too. But God leaves a thing for his own people, for the natural branches. It'll be far easier for the natural branches who once attained faith to be grafted back in. Not so for the, the wild olive branch that was taken out, that was grafted in and then cut off because of his lack of faith. They don't have the same promise. That's why we need, to, as Gentiles, you need not boast. Know where you're, where you're getting your, uh, your nourishment and your blessings from. And don't count it as uh, that on your own. See, that's just like, a, like people do. You know, they get rich, they, or whatever, they, instead of giving God the glory that it came from God, that was Israel's problem too before they went into Babylon. They thought of themselves of as, as attaining these things on their own. And they didn't give God thanks. And they forgot God. And so what happened? God sent them to Babylon, sent them out of the, out of the land. And it's at that time and place that they recognized their sin, what they had done. Ages and the wise men of that time wrote, Blessings for everything. I know people think it's a joke, but it's serious. I mean, it is kind of funny. There's a blessing for everything, you know. Um, we get that from uh, Fiddler on the Roof, and it is kind of funny when uh, Model gets his new sewing machine, and one of the the men there asks the rabbi, "Is there a blessing for the sewing machine?" He says, "Yeah, there's a blessing for everything." And there is, and that's what we need to be. We need to, when we see a rainbow, when we see uh, green grass, when we see a sunny day. When See, even see a graveyard. We're to give thanks to God. In everything, give thanks to God. Right? And that's what even the psalm says. Give thanks to God in everything. And so with this, Yeshua took upon himself the transference of our sins to him. And he died for those sins in that way, that transference. And then God raised him on the third day, the day after Passover, the two days after Passover. You had Passover. And then 
Passover started on the 14th, in the evening on the 14th of Nisan. Then you had the beginning of the unleavened bread, right? And so the 15th day also became the first day of the unleavened bread. On the 16th day was first fruits, where they would the to the field, which was right nearby. They even had a path to go that was cleared so nothing dead or anything had ever touched it. They go right into the field, gather their their thing of grain, bring it back, and do their wave offering as first fruits. Whatever it was actually it was wasn't it wasn't ready to be harvested yet. It was in its green. It had just started coming up. And they would go before this time and they would go through and they would mark them. What came up first? They would mark it. So that when out there that's what they would grab for their wave offering for first fruits, okay? Just in the, in the same way that Yeshua was marked as the Messiah, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, etc. And so he went to the heavenly because um, he is the high priest in the heavenly temple. He couldn't do that here because God already has a uh, uh, priestly... Um, he already has priests here on earth. And even uh, the book of uh, Hebrews even says that, that he's not a priest here on earth, but he is a heavenly priest on the order of Melchizedek. And we can look at that too, because guess what? Moses was also a priest on the order of Melchizedek. Because he's anointing the high priest. He's getting them ready and doing all these things, right? Only a high priest could do that. Moses wasn't a high priest here on earth. But he was the high priest of the heavenly God showed him the heavenly, had him build everything in, uh, in accordance to what he's seen of the heavenly temple. And then he became, in essence, a priest of the heavenlies uh, here on earth for temporary until the priest was set up. Or, or yeah, 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 sure, yeah. <laughs> That's good. <clears throat> yeah. Kadosh, 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 yeah. Um, and so we see Yeshua in the order of Melchizedek, right? And we would go on. Melchizedek. The son of Noah, Shem. And Melchizedek is a title, king of righteousness. He was king over the city of Salem, Shalem, which became Yerushalayim, Jerusalem. And he was also in that same order. That's why he's called the order of Melchizedek. Because according to traditions, according to what the nations knew at that time, uh, Shem was from of old, before this current world. He lived before the flood. <clears throat> he died well after many of the people that we know died, Abraham included. So he lived a long time from eternity to eternity, as, as they would say, right? So that's why it became the symbol. Yeah. I hate to run a reverse rabbit trail, but my heart was greatly stirred uh, when I was reading the book of Jacob. They had forgotten themselves, and it had been a blessing for so long. I was never taught, as a Gentile believer, I was never taught in its fullness. I was taught in a miniature, inadequate type of way. You're blessed because you joined yourself to Christ. Okay. But... Christ is the Messiah of the Messianic Covenant with Israel. I was never really taught I'm blessed and saved because of a covenant made with them. It extended even to the Gentiles. Yep. Uh, does that make the, In other words... You were blessed by a brand new covenant, not the same one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You said it's not its own thing in itself. Right. It's not something outside of the original covenant. And it, it, uh, nobody really ever addressed that with me. And then 
finally God is allowing the church to begin to wake up, uh, you became part of the covenant made with Israel when you believed in Christ. Mm -hmm. So it, it, we've made it an out, outside thing. Some people go so far yep. as to say, well, the church is Israel. No, I don't think so. But, uh, they say, well, what about the Jewish people? They, they're in unbelief. That has nothing to do with it. what yeah. I'm speaking of being right. wrapped into the church. Because Paul says, just because some don't believe, that doesn't make it null and void. Right. But, uh, yeah, and the covenants are built upon themselves. They not they don't do away with it. When one comes out, God makes another one. He doesn't get rid of the other ones. They're still right there in progression. Same with the the new covenant that's coming. That is, we've got a taste of it. You're part of that taste. You're part of that that uh, um, that little bit revealing of the of that new covenant that's coming when it takes its full full fruition that we read about in Jeremiah. Is we're not here. We're not here yet. But you're part of that, of that uh, uh, that first fruits that's coming. Yeshua, huh? Built upon, a foundation. Built upon a foundation. So you're part of that. And any Gentile and Jewish person, of course, that believes in Yeshua in the Torah of God through Yeshua, um, is part of that revealing of the new covenant that is coming. We're part of. We get a taste of it. We get to do it. We get some of it now. The rest of it will come at the end of the Messianic era, the thousand-year reign of Messiah, when we enter the, the eighth day, the day of new beginnings, when God transforms the earth and renews the earth and the heavens to where he had them before the fall of man. And we all get to partake in that. And at that time, it says that no man will have to teach his brother to know God because everyone will know him. He's going to write his Torah in our minds and on our hearts. And in the one we read in Ezekiel, he's going to give, take out our stony heart and replace it with a heart of flesh, right? That means, you know, we've come a long way in understanding things. God has revealed a lot of things to us that in that day, we're going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye that our bodies will no longer have the uh, genetic structure we have right now. Our genetic structure will, where it's natural to sin right now, that will be taken out and will be replaced with God's instruction, His Torah. It will be part of our DNA. So that right now, whereas we have, it's easy to sin, we won't even think about it then. It will be more natural for us to do good and follow God's ways. We won't even think about that stuff. It will be gone. From, it will no longer be a natural thing. It will be what you might call a supernatural thing because it would have to be supernatural for us to go and sin against God because it's not part of our genetic structure anymore. That's what we have coming. That's our hope. That's why you can take the whole world and the way it operates and what you're talking about. I want to be there. <laughs> Absolutely. I want to be there too. Christ Amen. Yep. 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 He... he Yep, and just as God promised Moses and the children of Israel, he would send a man like Moses, and that's Yeshua, and he's going to take us into that land. That, that's the real promised land, to be honest with you. When you really think about it, that's the real promised land that we get to look forward to and we have our hope in that. We're not going to heaven. God isn't bringing us to heaven. He built the earth for us to dwell on it and for him to dwell with us. Now, this is where we're going to be, but it's going to be a renewed heaven and a new earth. We're going to be renewed no longer with a nature of sin, but a nature of good. Right? Because unlike oh. Amazon, you renew sin. Like it doesn't cause it sin. <laughs> there you go, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so, you know, think about these things this week as we're, you know, got a couple weeks before Passover. How are our houses? I'm not just talking the physical house I'm talking about the bodily the spiritual house you know the things to think about just like uh, as we're getting ready for uh, Yom Kippur right we we go through and clean ourselves uh, do the right thing for people go to people ask for forgiveness forgive other people uh, do good do good deeds for people that maybe we wouldn't do for you know do the right thing right and with Passover 
it's getting rid of that leaven. Leaven represents sin, right? Leaven represents sin. That's why we get rid of sin. That's why none of God's offerings for hatat, sins, as we call it, were offered with leavening, any, any leavened bread. They were uh, with matzah, unleavened bread, right? And we are unleavened, as Paul says. Let's remain unleavened. But let's think about it. Make sure we get the leaven out of our lives. It's, it's a chore because, you, you know, it's just like cleaning a house. It's a chore. We've got to look at every nook and cranny. What? Spring cleaning, right? That's where it comes from. So we just take a look. You know, pray. God reveal these things to us as we prepare for Passover. The picture of getting rid of our sin. And there's so many other things that are in it. We'll go through that too. So, all right. So we'll bow our heads. Page 586. <clears throat> our God and God of our fathers, bless us with the threefold blessing in the Torah written by the hand of Moses, your servant, and pronounced by Aharon and his sons, the priests, your holy people, as it is said. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May it be your will. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May it be your will. May the Lord turn his face towards you and grant you peace. May it be your will. Yair Adonai panave lecha vichunecha. Yisar Adonai panave lecha v'yaseim lecha. Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shavua Tov. Everybody have a great week. Great rest of Shabbat. Just reminders, Tuesday night is our Torah club at 7 here on Zoom. Uh, 7 o'clock Wednesday is our Wednesday night study. Right now we're going through God's appointed uh, uh, tri- was it? Yes, customs. There we go. God's appointed customs by Rabbi Barney Kasdan. Wonderful books. Um, and then on the 12th, coming up in a couple of weeks, um, we have Sally Klein O'Connor coming to do music for us on a Friday night. That's 12th, uh, April 12th starting at 6 p.m. to 7.30, and after that we'll have a potluck meal together and usher in the Sabbath. Um, And then on the 27th of April, after uh, Shabbat, we'll have our community Passover Seder starting at 7. And that also will be potluck. Um, Everyone is welcome. People know. And my goal eventually is to uh, outgrow this place for these type of things and have to go someplace else to hold them, you know, so that people would see Yeshua as the Jewish Messiah, especially our fellow people, my fellow Jews, but also the nations and know that just as uh, when Israel came out of Egypt, they came out with a mixed company. People from other nations joined Israel. They, they took hold of Moses and the promises that God gave him and they went with Israel so that that's what we see is today is the Gentiles taking hold of Israel, taking hold of Yeshua, the ultimate Jew, <laughs> and going with Israel into the world to come, the eighth day. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, so... Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom, Good Shabbos.